Now I bring you the third and final installment of my gay marriage series, where I'll tackle four more of the most prevalent arguments against gay marriage, plus my own argument for gay marriage. Let's get right to it. The first on the list is this one. If gay marriage were made legal, businesses would be forced to give benefits to the partners of same-sex couples. My answer to this is, why shouldn't they? Businesses have been forced to give benefits to the partners of opposite-sex couples for years. Why withhold that luxury from same-sex couples? Again, the issue comes down to people in the anti-gay camp having rights they don't want gays to have. Although, this argument is mostly a red herring, as many companies already give the same benefits to same-sex couples that they give to opposite-sex couples, and for most of them, this was of their own choice. For those companies that changed in order to do business in a city or state that requires this as a law, there's hardly been any objections. The reality is this won't change the way businesses operate that much, seeing as only a tenth of the population are gay, and not all of them will be getting married. In the campaign to vote Prop 8 into law, one of the ideas put out by the religious right was that churches would be forced to marry gay couples or face the loss of their tax-exempt status. This one is another lie, seeing that churches can and do refuse to marry anyone they choose and still retain all legal rights they previously had. Many churches will refuse to marry one of their congregants to a member of another faith or another sect. These couples will usually have to go to another church, which is interfaith friendly, or simply get married at the courthouse or by a public official and have a completely secular wedding. In the U.S., churches are granted freedom of religion by the First Amendment, which states that Congress can make no law prohibiting the free exercise of an establishment of religion. The only way that a church can lose its tax-exempt status is if it were to cease being a church and become a business. Many people are afraid of gays recruiting and think that somehow making gay marriage legal will help in this recruiting. This couldn't be further from the truth. Gays are in no way looking to recruit, and to be quite honest, most don't even think it's possible. Gays know that their sexuality is something ingrained that they can't change. Knowing this, it would be as futile to turn a straight person gay as it is to turn a gay person straight. But wait, you might be thinking, aren't there gay people who do in fact become straight? The simple answer, no. The complicated answer is, it all depends on what you consider gay. There are people who have undergone so-called conversion therapy in order to become straight. However, the majority of these people freely admit that their attraction to the same sex never really goes away. They're basically playing the part of a straight person while still having the attractions of a gay person. Conversion therapists are not sanctioned by the American Psychological Association, and in fact, the prevalent attitude among psychologists today is that conversion therapy can be potentially harmful. Even if conversion therapy did work, with all of the effort that it takes to make a gay person straight, imagine how much more it would take to make a straight person gay. The last one is a little different from the others, being that it's not argued by the far right, but rather those in the center, and even from people who are pro-gay rights. The argument is that civil unions, domestic partnerships, or anything else you'd like to call these marriage alternatives, are just as good as marriage. Even President Obama holds the stance that civil unions are preferred compared to gay marriage. The problems with this aren't self-evident and need to be looked at a little closer. First off, in some areas that have civil unions, domestic partnerships, or some other form of gay marriage alternative, these unions don't always give the same rights that being a full married couple gives. However, the real mess comes in when we take away that difference, and the only difference is what it's called. You might be thinking, it's only a word. Why is calling it marriage such a big deal? Well, think of it this way. If it wasn't such a big deal, why does the other side have such a big problem with calling it marriage? The big deal is this. The back of the bus is just as comfortable as the front and takes you to the same place, but no one wants to be relegated to sitting at the back of the bus. To be treated differently just because you're a minority is degrading. It sends the message out that you're somehow subhuman or you're not as good as the rest. Marriage, not civil unions or domestic partnerships, but marriage is a right that we all should enjoy.
On a final note, I'd like to leave you with this. Marriage is about love, and it's about family. Not the family that you're born into, but the family that you choose by the partner you select. Marriage equality is about being able to visit in the hospital the one person in the world who means the most to you. It's about receiving the same benefits and drawbacks that other people get. The point is, marriage today isn't about some breeding contract that a man makes with a woman for the sole purpose of raising children. In fact, many couples are proof that marriage isn't even necessary for that. Marriage is about love, romantic love. A love that is so strong that you want to make that person part of your family, bonding them to you forever. And while many marriages today don't last forever, the feelings behind them are still valid ones. Isn't it nice to know that in today's world of drive-through marriages and next-day annulments, when people are looking for ways to make their relationships less permanent, some people are seeking ways to make their relationships more permanent.